We're back here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. John Schmelk, Paul Dottino from Indianapolis at the NFL Combine. We're joined by former NFL general manager, and of course he works for ESPN, and the man in charge of the 33rd team, which is an up-and-coming outfit here covering the NFL. He is Mike Tannenbaum. Mike, how are you, man? Good to see you. Yeah, good to be with you guys. How are you? We're doing great, man. It's fantastic to have you here. So we had Joe Shane. He, he spoke uh, to the media, to us, and to Good Morning Football this week. He said he's been kind of meeting with Daniel Jones' agents every day out here trying to get a deal done. You know what it's like in these situations for a GM. You know, put us in Joe Shane's shoes. What is this week like for him as he tries to get something done with Daniel Jones? You just switch agents, and this is kind of the, the first time he's dealing with this group. Yeah, you know, you got to think about really March 7th is the deadline, so that's Tuesday at 4 o'clock. Um, and really anything between now and then is important, but really heading into Monday is when things will really ramp up. And at some point, you got to put your best offer on the table. And the one thing I, I would say about what's really unique about the Giants situation is, and, I, and I've said, you know, roughly it's $100 million for three years. Like, that's where I'd be comfortable. But regardless if it's 10% more or less, and I'm sure there's, you know, some work to be done between both sides, I would say this. Given the unique situation of Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley, if I had to reach a little bit past my comfort zone to keep Daniel Jones under contract, I would do it this year from a context of like, okay, I'm paying that and I'm keeping Saquon Barkley because now I can franchise him. So to me, like in the back of my mind, it's really like almost like two for the price of one. You mentioned a unique situation. Mike, I went back into my memory banks. I could not remember a similar situation where a GM had to deal with a franchise quarterback and basically a franchise running back coming up due at the same time. This is just a nightmare. Yeah, well, I'm sure, like, you know, look, when you go through it, you're never going to get every decision right, but I'm sure hindsight, if they exercised the fifth-year option on Daniel Jones, it would have staggered it from a timing standpoint. Obviously, that's something that, you know, they'll reevaluate and think about how to handle in the future. And now you just say to yourself, look, it starts with the quarterback, and we got to keep, they're going to keep Daniel Jones because he may not be perfect, but when you look at the alternatives right now, is it Anthony Richardson? Is it Derek Carr? I mean, there's 14 teams that need a quarterback, and I'm sure what Daniel Jones' agent is saying is like, hey, we don't need to argue here. Let the market dictate it. Now, you know, for those people who say, well, the Giants should have used the fifth-year option on Jones, well, obviously, A, you didn't know how much he was going to improve because the ceiling, season, uh, the ceiling obviously raised itself this year because he had a great year. But there's the other thing about the durability factor. Daniel Jones had not played a full season without injury until this year. He had to prove that to them too. Yeah, no, there's uh, there's worse than any decision. I always look at a decision by saying, like, what are the alternatives? And, again, I, I think Daniel Jones is, you know, whatever you want to call him, a B, a B plus. He is far from perfect. You know, and he did miss some games. Um, now you look at down the road and Lamar Jackson, and he wants presumably $230 million fully guaranteed. And the last two years, he didn't finish the season. But again, the question I would have if I was the Ravens is, would I rather have Lamar Jackson for 14 games or for zero? And you know, that's that's sort of the analysis. And with 14 teams needing quarterbacks, there's just not enough of them to go around. As you try to manage the cat and the future as a general manager, and you look at the potential contract for Daniel Jones, right? You have the $32 million franchise tag as one option, which obviously you don't love because it kills your cap this year. But what you do like is that, all right, well, maybe this was a one-year blip for Daniel. This year's not as good. You have an easy way to get out of it, right? But you do a longer-term deal, cap money's a little bit lower, but then you can't get out of it as soon. So how do you balance the advantages and the disadvantages of yeah. both those and find what works for your team, especially given where the Giants are, where they're not Super Bowl contenders, but they did win a playoff game in the first year of the regime? Yeah, that's right. And look, I, I think it comes back to one very basic question, like who's playing quarterback for us? So, you know, even if you're outside your comfort zone, because again, like they're not a Super Bowl roster right now, but like to me, what's the alternative? Like, Let's say Daniel Jones graduates. Let's say they franchise Saquon Barkley. Like, who's playing quarterback next year? Right. And what's your plan moving forward? Because mm -hmm. if you win enough games to their credit, like, you're not going to probably be in a position to draft Caleb Williams the year after. So it's rare that a young, ascending, high character, durable quarterback is going to come available in free agents. So Daniel Jones isn't perfect, but to me, like, he's the start of giving you something stable at that position. Right, and I think we know he's going to be back next year because they can't tag him worst comes to worst. So I guess the question for you would be, what would be your priority? Having the ability to get out a little bit earlier and hedge your bet? Yeah. Or to 
get the cap number lower and have him for a longer period of time? Which would be the priority for you in this situation yeah. with Joe Shane? Yeah, like I, I, I've said countless times, like I would try to do a three-year deal. I probably stretch out of guaranteed money a little bit um, because let's face it, it, we don't have a huge body of work and three years gives you three more years to try to find his replacement. Uh, let me ask you about the mechanisms that a GM can use because everybody thinks about, oh, signing bonus, but there are so many. Roster bonus, appearance bonus, game-by-game -game bonus, workout, bonus, workout bonus. There are so many other triggers, and I believe Josh Allen with the Bills was, to me would be the model of the kinds of triggers I would use for Daniel Jones because the Bills did a great job of being able to you know, get his number manageable even though he got a very big contract. Can, can you explain maybe to the fans who don't understand all the different kinds of things you can do to maneuver that contract? Yeah, no, you, you just laid out a whole bunch of them. The other one I would add to is like just guaranteed money. So you may be a part on, you know, hey, 40 million up front, 50 million up front, but how much is guaranteed in later years and which years it's guaranteed often will drive like a, a compromise. So in this case, if the number 10, 15 million dollars apart in the sign bonus, but we're talking about a material third year guarantee that oftentimes will bridge mm -hmm. the gap because most times after the second year, there's not a lot of guaranteed money left. Right. All right, let's jump over to Saquon Barkley now. Uh, they can always tag him if they want, talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that. And then what do you think it would look like for Saquon if he does hit unrestricted free agency, given, frankly, how many good running backs are available on the market this year? And it's a pretty good draft class at the running back spot, too. Yeah, I think he'll do well. I think he's an explosive difference maker. I think his pass protection's gotten better. And he, he has, you know, if you take the word wide receiver off his back and say he's just a playmaker, you know, I see him and Tony Pollard very similarly. I don't think either guy should leave their teams. They're, they're, they're that good. Um, now, look, there's a long history going back to Todd Gurley and even McCaffrey of all these running back deals that haven't worked out. But mm -hmm. I think Saquon is homegrown, high character, improved, wants to be there. Like, those are the guys that you want to reward. So, again, you can't overpay people. you got to make hard decisions. But if you are going to give somebody the benefit of the doubt, Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley are those types of guys. How much of an impediment do you think it would be for either Barkley or Jones going forward as players if either one did not return? Well, I think they're both, I think that obviously depends on the scheme and where they are. I think they're both will figure out ways to be productive. Like if Saquon Barkley signs with the Atlanta Falcons, like I think he'd have a great year. You know, I think Arthur Smith would find ways to use him, maybe similar to the way he used Derrick Henry, for example. So mm -hmm. I do think both of them will, will do well, just because I, I know how how important football is to each of those guys. Mm -hmm. How would you build the Giants right now if you're Joe Shane? Because Mike, and look, Joe will never say this, but I think he probably assumes he's going to come here. The first year continues to be kind of almost like a teardown year, right? And then you really start building up now. Then the team goes out, they win nine games, they win a playoff game. And now you have good players you're going to want to bring back. How aggressive are you in free agency, or do you really still try to build up through the draft here so you collect a lot of players on those low-cost deals that you can have and build your roster with over the long term? Yeah, that, that's always going to be the foundation of your team, but you do have to be opportunistic and try to add players. Like, look at the team down the road that won the champ, well, got to the championship in uh, Philadelphia. You know, they had Linville Joseph and Adama Kinsuna in season. They trade for Gardner Johnson at the end of August. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was a team that adds... Jordan Mulata as a seventh round pick. Like, I think they've checked every box in terms of team building. They draft Jalen Hurts when they sign Carson Wentz to a big extension. So I think you have to be looking at improving your team year round. Remember when the uh, Bills were trying to get to the next level after they acquired Josh Allen and they were quickly moving up the ranks and they made the big trade for Stephon Diggs, which really kind of put them into Super Bowl contending category. Now, we're not saying the Giants are quite there yet. They're not. They're getting there, but they're not there yet. Do they make a deal to get an alpha wide receiver, in your opinion? Should they? Yeah, I would probably use resources otherwise because I do think there's a number of really good receivers coming out. Like where they're picking, maybe it's a guy like Jalen Hyatt from Tennessee mm -hmm. who's a big, strong, explosive player. So I wouldn't rule it out, but I think there's just – until you could fortify both lines, and, and I think there are improved lines for the Giants, like to me that's where the job really begins. Right. Tight end position, Mike. Are you a believer of waiting on the tight end, or do you think it's become a position now in the NFL where 
you can pick one in the first round if you really think it's going to be a difference maker in the passing game, and you know you can kind of create the mismatches you want in you know 12 personnel groups. I I think it's so important. Look at the Super Bowl, like Dallas oh, Goddard, yeah. Travis Kelsey, great players. You know, you look at George Kittle. You know, just look at the playoff teams; they all have them. Uh, even Hayden Hurst played really good for the Bengals. So to me, the now this draft is loaded with tight ends. That's why I asked. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, you know, look you now Evan Ingram. I think we all think he'll get franchised. Um, and there's a couple other in free agency, but um, I think this is a year you could draft one. Now, do you, are you more concerned with the two-way tight end now, or are you more concerned with the guys that are going to really impact the passing game? Yeah, it's really more on the passing game. they got to be able to cut off on the backside. Um, but, look, you know, the days of, you know, the 280-pound blocking tight end, you know, you just don't see that as much. You know, more teams are using a third tackle yep. in that situation. Um, but you got to be able to, you know, win and man-to-man -man and stretch the field and, um, there's a lot of good tight ends that can do that for sure in this year's draft. I got to ask your perspective on something here, Mike, about the run game. So many people kept saying, well, this is more and more of a passing league. So defenses were getting smaller and quicker. And all of a sudden you had six and seven defensive backs on the field all the time. You got that, that, that jumbo nickel package, the big nickel as they call it. And then teams started running the ball more and getting more physical and getting more powerful. And it looks like the tides kind of turned a little bit. So how important is it to have a big, stout, tough inside linebacker who can now counter the trend towards the running offense? Yeah, absolutely. You need all those things. And look, Jalen Smith, now he's not as big as what you said, right? but like he came in and played really good you know, down the stretch. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I think both of the Giants linebackers actually – were with the team. Um, what, I'm trying right. to think. What, no, they what, weren't. Right? In fact, Jared Davis started in the playoffs for them. He didn't pick him up until Christmas time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, John the Strip. I mean, it was like Josh Schaub starting a playoff game for the Jaguars. Right. But to answer your question, absolutely. I think you need some physicality there. The problem is when you have a first and second down Mike linebacker who's, let's say, 245 to 255 mm -hmm. pounds, that doesn't usually translate great into the kicking game. Like, those guys aren't great in space to cover. Right. That's why when your backup linebackers can run, you know, those guys cover. But I think it's fair, like, if you can't stop the run, especially if I'm, like, the Giants or the Cowboys, like, knowing that Philadelphia has a big physical offensive line. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, like, Philadelphia is hard to stop because Jalen Hurts makes great decisions and his accuracy's gotten better. But – if you can't defend their run game, it's going to be hard to beat them consistently. No doubt. And by the way, the Giants didn't defend their run game in both matchups mm -hmm. this year. Final one for me, Mike. If you're the Giants, you have Wink Martindale as your D.C., right? Loves to blitz play man-to-man. -man. If you want to take the next step as a defense this year, what would you look to build out if you're the Giants front office to try to get that defense to where you want it to be? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I worked with Rex Ryan for a while at the Jets. Same thing. Just You, you need guys that could cover. And it's hard. Like, you want to have four, five, six corners. That, and and you, know, you talked about the big nickel. Like, you could slide a... a a corner over to safety in pass situations. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those matchups aren't ideal, but um, you really want to have depth at like corners and corners that can play man to man. Final question from me goes to the coaching yeah. staff with Brian Dable and Mike Kafka on the offensive side of the ball. When you saw what these guys were able to do and blend it together, and Dable actually gave the play calling to Kafka, when a lot of folks thought maybe he was hired to make the play calls, how surprised were you in that regard, and how well w do you think that that will continue to progress on offense for that? Yeah, you know, it says a lot about Brian. You know, he's a, a natural leader, and when things go well, he's going to celebrate his staff, and when things go poorly, it'll be his fault. And uh, I've known Brian for a long time. He hasn't changed at all. He's... Um, He's a special guy, and the Giants are looking to have him. Cool. It's the old Tom Coffin philosophy. He always said to us, when things go bad, it's the coach's fault. When things go right, it's the player's did it. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> that, that's what great coaches do. Mike, this is great. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Great Appreciate to see you, Mike. Thank you so much. Yeah.